Well, good morning. I'm sorry we're getting started a little bit late. Sometimes it's like when you get up in the morning and you just don't get going, right? And so um, even morning people know what that's like sometimes, don't you? So, but today we're going to be talking about the little town of Bethlehem and then also the message of the angels to the shepherds outside of the city of David. And so prepare your hearts and ask God to do a work in you, a work of, of faith where you too and those around you can experience the Savior, the Christ, um, the Lord, and the one who was promised from the line of David who would come for us. Amen. Um, today also is exciting because we are going to be installing our new uh, associate pastor, Bailey Arnold. And so, Bailey, stand up real quick so we can talk to him. He's going to be working with our youth and our young adults and anything else that God would have his hand put to. Amen. And so um, just be waiting for that during the announcement time. But for now, let's stand to our feet and let's pray and ask God to work in our hearts. Father, we ask that you would move in us today, this second Sunday of the Christmas season. We thank you that we get to be back together um, in person and we thank you uh, for the folks that have decorated this building in such a special way so that we can truly celebrate the light and the life that we have through Jesus Christ and we ask that you would move in us this morning and that you would speak to our hearts and that we would leave this place transformed so that we can go out and transform lives by making disciples. Move within us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. The second candle of Advent is the Bethlehem candle. Over 2,000 years ago in the small town of Bethlehem, God's one and only son, Jesus, was born. That baby was a living expression of God's unfailing love for a sinful world that appeared to have no room for him. 700 years before Christ's birth, the prophet Micah wrote, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Jesus' apostles Matthew confirmed that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Luke, the gospel writer, recorded Jesus Christ's birth in this way. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own to register his own town. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, in Galilee in Judea, to Bethlehem, the city of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for him for them in the inn. That first Christmas was the only space available for Jesus in Bethlehem was a feeding trough in a stable. This Christmas, we can all open our hearts to him and give him a dwelling place. He can make king in each of us. The first question is whether or not you will open your hearts to Jesus, inviting him in and confessing him as Lord. The second question is whether or not you will help others to do the same. Will you help others to open their hearts to Christ this Christmas? Thank you, Tina. Do you all appreciate how beautiful the place is today? Isn't that great? I know a member uh, came out. Cindy was leading the charge. And, um, and so we appreciate that, Cindy. And everybody who was here yesterday, um, Carolyn and Kathy and Hannah and Seda and Judy. Who am I missing? Tina, okay, sorry, Tina. Um, just really appreciate them doing that. Isn't it beautiful? Um, yeah, I think it is. It's just beautiful. And we get to be together today. I want to remind you of what our mission is uh, in the Christmas season and every season. It is to transform lives by making Christ-like disciples wherever we go. And so Christ has transformed us so that we can go out and transform the world. He has blessed us so that we can go out and bless the world. Amen? Um, and so let's be ready for that. Prepare your hearts. Maybe somebody will ask you this Christmas uh, about Jesus or about the shepherds or, or something of that nature. You have the opportunity sh to share Christ with that person. Um, I was thinking just this week when the Lord put on my heart to share the good news of Jesus with one of the workers here 
that has been working for several weeks, um, making uh, all of the new remodeling efforts in, in the basement. And the Lord just told me, speak to him, right? And um, whenever I hear that, sometimes I'm kind of surprised, right? Um, and I was surprised in that moment. But then I shared the good news with him and he was very receptive to, to the gospel. And so you just don't know when God's going to open somebody's heart and soften their heart to the truth of the gospel. So be ready for the Lord to do that in your life. I um, want to tell you about our Christmas pastor and um, Pastor Richie Oswega and his wife, Betty. Um, they work at the Kingdom Rock Church of the Nazarene. They've had a very difficult year with COVID. 18 members of their congregation have had COVID. And uh, one of the members of the congregation passed away um, at the beginning of this COVID time. And then um, about a month ago, Pastor Richie and uh, Pastor Betty, they, they both got COVID too. <laughs> and so um, it has been a difficult time for them. Um, they have three children that are still living with them. Um, Richie, I think he's a Richie Jr. And, um, and then Ethan, and then Nolene, and um, they all go to James Irwin Charter Schools. So some of you will know them. Um, but folks, I believe that we can be a blessing. We don't get to do it like we've gotten to do it in the past because of COVID. You know, usually we would um, gather food. This year, we're asking you to get a gift card. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. So that happens sometimes, doesn't it? Um, but instead of getting food this year, you could get a gift card um, for a fast food chain. I bet those um, kids, high school and middle school, would love to have that. And then, um, whew, so then we got there, <laughs> we got back. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, usually we would buy them clothing and, and we would pack uh, the clothing and those kind of things and uh, wrap that with, you know, uh, Christmas paper and those kind of things. This year, we are just going to give a wallet with a check in it. Um, just because of, you know, the things that are going on with COVID. Uh, but I believe that we can bless this family. I believe we can bless the church. And so uh, if you haven't given for Christmas pastor yet, um, when it comes to the offering time, I encourage you to do that. When the offering time does come, there are three places to give your offering. Um, over here on the sides and then in the back. Um, and as the ladies lead us, um, you can just stand up and then take your offering to those places. If it's for Christmas pastor, be sure to mark it Christmas pastor. Um, also want you to know that on December 20th, our children are, we're going to make the attempt, our children are going to sing for us. And Kathy's going to be playing and the kids have been rehearsing. And so be ready for that. You'll want to see these children sing and um, and they have already been rehearsing whether it was at church or at home. And so they've been rehearsing and getting ready for this. So bring somebody with you if you can on December 20th. Um, at this point, um, I would really like to introduce to you Pastor Bailey Arnold. Pastor Bailey, if you would come on up here. Um, Pastor Bailey uh, expressed to us his desire to serve and uh, to work in a church and we're just really glad you're here, Pastor Bailey. And he's going to share with us in this moment his testimony of calling into ministry. Yeah, so um, I grew up in church. Uh, whenever I was in, I was born, when I was born, I was, um, my parents were going to East Bro. Um, and some of my first memories of church were in this sanctuary. Um, I remember coming to VBS um, whenever I was in kindergarten and first grade. Um, and then my family went to True Life whenever it was planted from Eastboro. And then um, as I um, continued to grow in God and with Jesus, I, I felt this desire to serve the church and 
Whenever I was in middle school, um, that looked like I played on the worship team and I, I served with the kids. And I, I, I did everything I could to just be active in the church. And I, what I didn't know is that God was preparing me for future ministry. In 2011, I was at Nazarene Youth Conference, and um, I, I, I was going into my sixth grade year of um, middle school. And at the time, I wouldn't have said it, but I was... Uh, I was a broken person. I, I was having problems with friends, and um, church just kind of just wasn't my wasn't my thing. Um, I went to church, but it was kind of like one of those things where you just go because that's the right thing to do, and my family's going, so I'll go. Um, but then it was at Nazareth Youth Conference that there was a speaker. His name was Reggie Dabbs, and um, he happened to be talking about brokenness that night and how God can put our life back together. So God was leading me, uh, through the service, God was leading me on a journey about, about giving my life to him and putting my, the pieces of my life back together. And then at the end of that service, God then told me, I want you to be a pastor. Um, and let me tell you, I was terrified. Um, I, I wanted nothing to do with that. So I decided um, that it wasn't, it wasn't for me and I wasn't going to do it. So I decided that, um, that I was just going to ignore it. Um, and I, cause I had my whole life planned out. I had, um, I, wanted, I wanted to go into the Air Force, um, and I wanted, I had everything planned out. So I was kind of mad that God decided to change that plan, but um, God was patient with me, and he let me take the time that I needed to fully accept this call. And it took uh, several months, but I remember on a Sunday morning, I was back at the, um, I was doing slides for, for a Sunday morning worship service. And I remember this overwhelming presence of God just saying, this is the plan I have for you, to be a pastor. And I, and I remember finding myself at the altar that Sunday. And I told God that I would I'll only do this if you're with me the whole way. And so from that point on, uh, I had no idea what ministry would look like, but I faithfully walked through it. And um, I, was, I was grateful to have an awesome church at True Life and with Pastor Keith to be able to, at, in high school, to be able to help him lead the youth group and that I'm grateful that he was able to give me that experience. And then I went to Mid-America Nazarene University where I majored in ministry. And um, if you ever want to know some crazy roommate stories, I got them for you. Um, <laughs> and um, then, I, then I found myself at um, True Life doing the I, was, I did uh, kids and teens, and then um, I felt God calling, t calling me and saying, that's time for a change, which I don't like change. Um, but then I, then I found myself um, talking with Pastor Jim and, and then starting the process. And I, am, I, I want to tell you, tell you that I'm so excited that I'm here and that I, that I look forward to um, ministering to all of you here. Yeah. Stay up here, baby. Uh.
um, we're going to go ahead and install Bailey as our associate pastor, working with our teens and working with our young adults and whatever else God would call him to. And so um, for the installation of officers in the church, um, we recognize God's way of setting apart certain workers for specific areas of Christian service. And so we come to this moment for the installation of Pastor Bailey Arnold. Um, Pastor Bailey, as you've heard, he's been chosen by God for this work. Amen? And uh, he's been chosen by God, too, then to um, work at our church. And our leadership, um, though we can't do it the way we would like today, um, and you, you're laying your hands on Pastor Bailey and saying that he is an associate pastor at Eastboro Church of the Nazarene. Um, but Pastor Bailey, I want you to consider these words from um, God's holy word. Paul told the believers in Rome, and I will tell you now, I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what's God, what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Um, Paul told a, a young pastor, Timothy, and I will tell you this now, um, do your best to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the truth. Um, and I also encourage you in the same way that the Apostle Peter admonished the elders of the congregations that he oversaw. Um, he said, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those who are allotted to you, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Um, so we come to this important moment when you, before the Lord, will take upon yourself the task of caring for the affairs of our church in caring for our teens and also caring for the young adults and whatever God would have you put your hand to. Um, look upon the assignments that you now assume as special opportunities for service for our Lord and find joy and blessing in the performance of your duties. Will you do so? Yeah. Amen. So um, we're going to do a worker's covenant at this point. So in consideration of the confidence that uh, we have placed in you as Eastboro Church of the Nazarene and the church at large, uh, will you covenant to do the following? To endeavor to lead people to Christ, especially teens and young adults, by manifesting an active interest in their spiritual welfare and by supporting the evangelistic efforts of our congregation? Um, will you covenant to guide believers to the experience of the purity of purity of heart, spirit and filling, and Christian maturity? Will you covenant to maintain a high standard of Christian living and example in harmony in the ideals within the standards of God's word? Will you covenant to cultivate your personal Christian experience by setting aside every day time for study of the Word of God and prayer? Um, will you preserve the unity of the body in the spirit and the bond of peace by loving and respecting your brothers and sisters in Christ and working out conflict in biblical ways? Then will you covenant to attend faithfully all duly called meetings of the various councils and committees to which you will be assigned? <laughs> and will you covenant to improve yourself and your skills by participating in training as opportunity is afforded 
you. If you will covenant to do these things, please say, I will. I will. Amen. Well, um, you've pledged your heart and your hands to this task, the task of carrying forth the work of the Church of Jesus Christ in your assignment. And so I get to install you as an associate. Whoa, something happened. Oh, well. Sorry, everybody. So I get to saw you as associate pastor at Eastboro Church of the Nazarene. You're now vital part in the organizational structure and leadership of our church. So may you, by example, by belief, and by diligent effort, be an effective worker in the vineyard of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, now I want to say to all of you, yep, something happened. Thanks, Paul. Um, can I ask all of you to stand right now and make a commitment to Pastor Bailey has committed before us. Um, this is my question. Will you commit to support Pastor Bailey in prayer? And will, when you are called to work in the vineyard of the Lord alongside him, will you say yes? And when there is difficulty, and uh, Pastor Bailey, just like me and Tina or Seda's um, weaknesses are manifest, will you be patient with us and come and speak to us according to the Word of God, like it says in Matthew? And will you commit to seeing Christ's good news taken to teens and young adults? through his ministry and help them in that way. Will, will you commit to that? If you'll commit to that, will you say yes? Yes. yes? yes. Amen. Well, let's stretch out our hands. And we can't lay hands on you, Pastor Bailey, right now. I'm probably standing too close to you. But um, stretch out your hands. And um, I'm going to do something special. I wasn't expecting to do this. Pastor Dan, will you come up here and will you pray for Pastor Bailey? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this young man who has given his life to you and the way that you've worked with his life to bring him to the place where he is. And this is a place of important valuable service here within our church here at Eastboro. Lord, would you encourage him? Would you strengthen him? Give him a vision for what you want him to do and for what, what you want us to do as well. And Father, as he leads, would you allow us to follow him as we would follow you? And so, Father, this is a task that he doesn't take on upon, on upon himself alone, but we are with him and gathered around him, and more importantly, the Lord is with him. Yes. I love the fact that, that he accepted your call with that condition. Lord, if you'll go with me, I'll go. Amen. And Father, we know you're faithful, and you'll use him, you'll bless him, you'll bless us through him. Yes. And we give you thanks and praise. So, Father, bless this young man, use him in a special way, and Father, each one of us, we, we commit ourselves to support him and to help him in every way we can. Lord, be blessed through him. We thank you, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give it to Lord and Amen. You may be seated. Um, so we've come to that time where we wanted to take our morning tithes and offerings as uh, Kathy and Carolyn and Sam lead us. Um, feel free to go ahead and take your offerings to the tables on the sides and in the back. But let's pray. Father, we rejoice. We rejoice today that you brought a, a new associate pastor to us. We're so excited about what you will do in and through him as he serves um, as a shepherd here at East Grove Church of the Nazarene. Father, we ask that um, you would put your hand of blessing upon our congregation as we make efforts to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. We ask that every cent that is given today will be 
useful for life transformation, for people who don't know anything about you yet. We ask that it would be useful for discipling people so that they can become more and more like Jesus. Uh, we ask that it would be useful so that folks would surrender their lives to you and would be free from the power of sin dominating their lives. That instead, they would now have you as true Lord of all that they are. Um, now, use these funds, oh God, for the advancement of your kingdom. And bless the gift, bless the giver, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the next song that we're singing is called Make Room. And it asks, is there room in your heart for God to write a story? You can come as you are and expect you apart when you make room in your heart and trade your dreams for his glory. And I pray that each one of us will do that. You'll join us in singing.
Let's pray. Father, today we just want to say there is room in our hearts for you. Oh, Spirit of the living God, come in and dwell. Just as Jesus dwelt among us in human flesh, now dwell within us. Lord, we, we do say to you today, not our dreams, but what you would have for us. And we say to you, not what we want, but what you want, your will be done in our lives, just as it's done in heaven. Will you speak forth your word and do a work within each of us? Lord, we want to be Christ-like, humble ourselves, just like Jesus humbled himself. The one through whom and by whom and for whom all things were made in heaven and on earth. Oh God, becoming a humble servant, being born in a barn, being laid in a trough. Lord, let us be willing to serve others and love others in that way. Oh God, enable us and transform us. Oh Lord, we think of our days as a nation and the craziness that is all around us. Lord, let us not see or yield to fear, but yield ourselves to you and accomplish your commission to go and preach the good news to all creatures. Oh Lord, that we would yield to your commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, uh, to love your enemies and to bless even those who persecute you. Lord, let us be the folks that show Jesus through our love, our love for those who don't know you and our love for one another. Oh God, do a work within us, we pray. Lord, we, we think of people who are hurting right now. We think of pastors across Colorado. I think of Pastor Tony Filele at our Samoan church in Aurora. And I think of Pastor Jim Finch at the Columbine Hills Church of the Nazarene and Richie and Betty. Lord, I think of um, Pastor Tammy Haddix, Pastor Gary's wife. Lord, and how all of them are going through very difficult times because of health. And Lord, we ask that your healing hand be upon each of these pastors to raise them up. We also think of Cat Worth, Lord, how she's been um, diagnosed with COVID. And uh, think of AJ Arndt, diagnosed uh, with sickness, Lord, that is so painful and debilitating. Father, we ask that your mighty hand would descend upon both of them. I think of Jenna Kirby with her diagnosis, Lord, and Eve Ramsey. And God, we ask that you would make the stripes that Jesus received before the cross. Make them count for their healing, Lord. God, raise them up. Give them health. Give them strength, new vigor. You're the one who heals all of our diseases. You're the one who, um, by whose stripes that we're healed. You're the one who can carry these sicknesses far, far away. And so we ask for your intervention. Lord, we ask that not only for these pastors and these members of our church, but we also ask that for our nation and the nations of the world. Lord, oh God, we ask that you will bless our medical personnel. We hear stories of them getting overwhelmed and ICUs being filled. And Lord, we just ask, show your mercies, but also Lord, help us. This uh, red flag has gone up so that we'll put up the white flag. Let us surrender our lives to you, surrender ourselves to you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Test, 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 test. Okay. So Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Um, we're going to see that the call of the angels to the shepherds and to all of humanity is um, that they abandon fear and embrace the Savior born in Bethlehem. So go with me, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. It says this, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. 
This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would move in us today. That um, we too would embrace the Savior in the city of David. The Lord, the Christ. Oh God, as you shine upon us, help us to receive your word and believe. Work within us, in our hearts now. And God, may the words that I speak forth today be effective for communicating the good news. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, God is calling these folks out of fear to a Savior. Out of the darkness of fear to a Savior. It says there in Luke um, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Out of this verse, I want to especially point out the reality that these were shepherds. They were the, lonely, the lowliest of the low in a certain sense. They weren't as low as a Gentile or a Samaritan. They weren't as low as somebody with leprosy. But these men were known as the unclean. These were not the people that you announced amazing news to of victory. Um, in the world's values... Probably we would imagine that this announcement would have come to Herod or the chief priests um, or the heads of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But this message came to lowly shepherds, lowly shepherds who were in the dark. Not only in the dark out in the fields taking care of sheep, but in the dark According to the society, when it came to the knowledge of things and intelligence and studies, these guys were those who were in the dark. And yet, Jesus, who would become the shepherd of our souls, sent the angel to the shepherds. He sent the angel to the shepherds. And look at verse 9. It says, And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Have any of you ever seen an angel? I haven't met a lot of people that have. Okay? No? All right. Um, if you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament... Whenever an angel of the Lord appears to somebody, usually they are terribly frightened. They're terribly afraid. They're gripped with fear. Um, but look at how, how it happens, right? It says an angel of the Lord stood before them. Um, does, does that mean like in Star Trek? You, you know how when they beam them down and beam them up. Um, I honestly don't know the details of that. What we do know is that idea of standing before them meant that somebody was present, somebody came upon them. Um, in Thayer's Greek lexicon, it says that someone stood over them and placed theirself above them. And so I kind of have this picture that maybe what the angel looked like that day was just somebody massive, somebody glorious and huge, somebody who emitted light because the glory of the Lord shone around about the shepherds, and he was above them and over them and began to speak with them. Well, I'll be honest, um, in my life there have been moments when I have been fearful. Um, 
One of those moments um, was very much deserved. I was sitting in the front row at Nazarene Indian Bible College at Sunday night service. I was six years old and I had Hot Wheels. And my dad was preaching at the pulpit. And I kind of forgot about the sermon and got very excited about the Hot Wheels there in the front row. And I may have begun to make certain noises. All I know is that the sermon and the church service ceased to exist. And what did exist was Hot Wheels in that moment. Until I heard a voice that from above me said, Jimmy Joe. Jimmy Joe. All of a sudden, I was filled with fright. I was paralyzed. I didn't move. Jimmy Joe, when we get home tonight, we're going to talk. So I can just imagine these shepherds, if the imposing um, picture of this angel being above them, appearing, um, if it didn't frighten them, and my dad's Jimmy Joe did, did frighten me, uh, what do you think they were feeling in that moment? They too, I believe, were frightened. You'll read about prophets that see visions of the Lord and what happens to them. Some of them just fall on their faces dead. That's what happened with Daniel, right? And Gabriel, when he saw, when Daniel the prophet saw Gabriel, boom. These men were scared. Uh, the root word for, for fear here um, is, is a word that means you're so frightened you want to run away. You want to get out of that place. And they were terribly frightened. Um, you can just imagine the awe-inspiring radiance all around them. And they were ready to get out of Dodge. Well, I guess out of Bethlehem, right? And yet, even in their fright, what is the message of the angel to them? Do not be afraid. Do not fear. I want you to think about how fearful they were for a moment. Um, there's a actual triple emphasis of words here. When it says they were terribly frightened, uh, the verb um, to be frightened is, is one word. And then the next word um, is the noun for fear. And then the third word is an adjective for mega. Okay? Or big or huge, very. And so, if I were to um, translate it in my gym translation, it would go like this. They became fearful so much fear. But the translators don't translate it like I do. But they became fearful so much fear. Um, I think of some moments in my own life where... Um, I kind of thought I might die. Have, have you, any of you had any of those experiences where you thought, okay, here it comes. Um, we were working in, I was working in Peru and we had gone to do district assemblies in the jungles of Peru. About three weeks before, a child had disappeared in the jungles of Peru. A work and witness team was accused of that abduction. And um, I remember when we got on the plane to go to these meetings out in the jungle, I thought to myself, I wonder whatever happened with that child. Well, um, the first night that we were there, in the middle of the night at midnight, the director of the Bible Institute where we were staying showed up at the door of the missionary's house. Um, I heard him come up on his motorcycle, called out, Pastor Manuel, what's going on? He said, can you get... 
um, Pastor, can you get Brother Larry? Get Brother Larry. Larry Garman was, you know, a missionary for 42 years out in the Peruvian jungle. And when I called for Brother Larry, he didn't sound like he wanted to get out of bed. And he, I guess, elbowed his wife and said, well, you go out there and see what Manuel wants. Well, as I watched Manuel describe the story to um, Sister Addie, um, Addie all of a sudden just bent over like this. And when she finally got up, she said, Jim, get Larry, Jim, get Larry. And so I went and I got Larry and what we heard from Manuel was that it had come over the ham radio lines that a truckload, as in a semi-truck load, of tribesmen from the Agaruna tribe, from where the child had been abducted, was coming to the Bible Institute to take revenge for the disappearance of this child. Um, that night, um, me and my boss, Marlon, we were put into the only cement building in the place because everything else was wood. So they figured that if they put us in the cement uh, cinder block place, that if they set it on fire, we would have more likelihood of surviving. And uh, I will never remember, I will never forget, excuse me, about how um, concerned I was. That night, we prayed about losing our lives. We prayed about losing our lives. Um, the other people that were there were concerned too. Um, Marlon, he had taken a sleep aid before all this happened. Um, and Marlon, he wasn't worried about it at all. Not, um, he, he prayed through and went to sleep. Um, as we were in the library, they also took all the children from that Nazarene Bible Institute and put them in the library. And they also took all the young women and Addie, and they put them all in that library. And Marlon, in his peace, began to snore. Marlon began to snore like... And then it intensified because the sleep aid was working quite well. And as the night went on, Marlon just kept on enjoying. Well, we were on one side of that um, cement structure and um, the ladies and the children were on the other side and they sent ambassadors over and they said, Brother Jim, Brother Jim, can you get him to stop doing that? Everybody's gonna hear because the fear was, is that they would hear that all these people were in the library and they would attack the library first so there could be no sound and no noise. There could be no light coming out of the library. And so throughout the night, I, after receiving the emissaries, would try to wake Marlon up, try to get him to turn over. Each time I would try to wake Marlon up, he would try to do karate on me. You know, when you're waking up from that deep sleep. Well, but what is the point? Everybody in that building, except for Marlon, was very concerned that they would die that night. They were concerned that their lives would be taken. Um, when we see the holiness of God before us and his holy angels, it's not like seeing the little fat angels that are painted, you know, on the top of the Sistine Chapel. Um, it is something that is very frightful. It makes you want to run. It makes you think I could die. And some people, it seems to be actually, um, portrayed as actually dying until the angel touches them. And yet the message of the angel to their mega fear, to their motion of fear, to their movement of fear in their minds and hearts and in their souls was do not fear. Um, some of us in these days in the United States of America, when um, there are protests in the street and rioting and buildings being um, destroyed, um, in the, these days in the United States, when we kind of have the sense of um, 
kind of have the sense of explosive possibilities of civil unrest and wondering what will happen politically in this nation, we can be full of fear. Fear that grips us. Fear that makes us want to run. Fear that wants to make us move to Australia. And I believe that the message to us too would be, do not be afraid. A Savior has been born to you in the little town of Bethlehem. He is Christ the Lord. Do not be afraid. In the situation in the jungle, God intervened and he freed us from threat and freed us from harm. And Christ today, the Savior that was born in Bethlehem, that came to just common people, they weren't presidents, they weren't secretaries of state, they were not Justice Department heads and those kind of things. They were just normal people and the message in their darkness and the message in their fear as they interacted with an emissary of God was, do not be afraid, there's a Savior that has been born to you. And I believe that in these days, if the people of God will take that message and say, you know what? There is a savior for the United States of America. Oh, so often we get duped by the devil into thinking, well, if the Democrats get it, well, it's just over. Uh, others are the same way. Well, if the Republicans get it, it's just over. There would be more doomsayers that would say, if the Chinese get it, it's over. It is never over for the church of Jesus Christ, for a Savior who is Christ the Lord has been born for us. And we can trust him. And there are more eternal things to think about. For our debt has been paid. And he saved us from our debt when he died on the cross. Satan's power has been broken when he went to the cross. He said, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And we are free then from the power of Satan. Sin that dominated us. Much, much worse than any regime could ever dominate us. Has been undone. And now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because a Savior has been born for us. Those who can't do anything about big national movements in our minds. Well, we can pray and that can change big national stuff and worldwide stuff. That's true. But we who often feel so helpless and yet who also long for a Savior just like those shepherds did, a Savior has been born to us. He is Christ the Lord. Do you believe that today? Has the glory of the Lord shown about you? Have you heard the message, do not fear? I believe that the glory of the Lord is still shining from the cross to this day. Amen? I believe that the glory of the Lord is still shining from that little town of Bethlehem to this day. I guess the question is, will we believe it? Will we believe it? Salvation is so often so nearby. Salvation for those shepherds was just in the little town of Bethlehem. All they had to do was go to Bethlehem and see. Salvation is nearby for each one of us too today. Salvation is nearby for his church. Salvation is nearby for our friends and family and co-workers. Will we receive the message though? The Savior has been born. He is Christ.
the Lord. We stand to your feet and let's pray. Oh God, we are so thankful for the Savior that you gave unto us. We thank you for Christ, the Lord. Oh God, we thank you that your King, your Deliverer, has come out of that humble Bethlehem barn trough manger and he has ascended to your right hand and he rules and is Lord today. We ask that as we look at what's going on around us that maybe we would be able to have some eyes to see your glory. Um, some ears to hear your message that still rings true, that a Savior has been born for us. A Messiah, Christ, the Lord. Will you please move within us so that we would take that hope wherever we go? Oh God, that we would communicate that hope on our Facebook um, pages and our Pinterest and in our, through our TikToks and all of that, that we would communicate that good news that a Savior is here for us. Lord, that we would walk through life not freaking out, but believing and trusting in that the light that has shown us upon our lives would shine to others so that they too could meet the Savior from the town of David. We need your help, Lord. Move within us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, you may be seated because we're going to dismiss row by row.